Hi. So convention without convening. This is based on a paper with Eric Madsen, Convention Without Convening from Constitutional Political Economy. <clears throat> the stars are David Hume and David K. Lewis. Let's begin with the two coordinations, which are exposited in this book. Concatenate coordination is the coordination, think of it from the transitive verb, an, an interior designer, say, coordinates colors, fabrics, patterns to make a beautiful look of the room. The patterns and so on are coordinated. You can also think of the owner or manager of a pin factory coordinating the laborers, uh, the activities, the machines, so as to produce a nice co um, concatenation of activities that is beautiful to behold for the owner of a pin factory, one of the um, prominent forms or paramount aspects of beauty in this case would be profitability. Um, but a concatenation can have coordination without actually having been directed or designed by a coordinator. We can still speak of the coordination, the concatenate coordination of um, a, a concatenation uh, as with a spontaneous order. For example, the whole set of activities that make a woolen coat in Adam Smith's famous example. So that's concatenate coordination. And this is concatenate coordination, the papa caterpillar here says strength and speed are useful son but coordination is crucial so the coordination of the legs when you walk as a caterpillar you've got to coordinate those to make a beautiful as it were walk or you know movement okay and that's in distinction to mutual coordination this is from the intransitive verb we don't coordinate something objects to a concatenation we coordinate with other people uh, with being a prepositional phrase we coordinate with other people um for example in the road game driving both on the left side of the road rather than the right side of the road this is i guess a british example where the steering columns are on the other side of the car from the americans um and have a higher payoff um but but right right also would be a coordination equilibrium here as we'll see this is a famous one and then another famous uh, coordination game is battle of the sexes where the man prefers the prize fight and the woman prefers the ballet but they also put a premium on being together um and and so these are two coordination equilibria here this is mutual coordination <laughs> so you know just in terms of relating concatenate and mutual i mean one thing you could say here about this british example of the road game is that while this is a mutual coordination outcome um in a sense it's inferior in concatenate coordination so you see concatenate and mutual don't necessarily go entirely hand in hand okay that's in distinction say to the prisoner's dilemma just as an example of something that's not a coordination equilibrium defect effect is a nash equilibrium each player is doing best uh given what the other player is doing but in this in this particular strategy combination here defect effect but it doesn't have that coordination aspect of given furthermore given what i'm doing i like what the other is doing see that's not true here if i'm player one here i'm going defect i would actually prefer that the other guy cooperate because then i would get three all right so this doesn't satisfy the additional condition for coordination equilibrium 
so you can write out Nash equilibrium such that I do a best response given what other people are doing. It's also said to be a strategy profile or combination from which no one has an incentive to deviate. And coordination equilibrium is a narrower concept, um, a, a stronger definition. Uh, it admits less into the set. It, it is both the Nash condition, but furthermore, a condition that I like what each person is doing, given what the rest of us is doing. You see, this allows here for other players, not me, I, to vary their play, plugging in something else into this S star and what this says is that the S star is greater or equal than any of those other possibilities for individual deviations by other players as well. Now, <clears throat> this presentation puts this as two conditions, and that, that's because the J is bounded away, is constrained away from being I, the one we're testing the utility of in each case here, but if you just erased this right here, you would actually have a statement that then subsumes the Nash condition number one here. And so here it is. So you can actually put it down into a single condition this way, letting J in this case be I as well, covering that Nash condition. And this fits perfectly uh, Lewis's, David Lewis's, this is from his 1969 convention of philosophical study um, which uh, was his dissertation published in 1969 by Harvard University Press. Um, let me define a coordination equilibrium as a combination in which no one would have been better off had any one agent alone acted otherwise, either himself or anyone else. So this either himself is the Nash condition or someone else is that second condition when we put it as two conditions. So coordination equilibrium, like I say, is a stronger definition. It admits less. And so it's a subset of, of Nash equilibrium. And what we have here is an agreeableness without agreement. Um, I like to say even in RR here, um, I like that given that I'm going R on player one, given that I'm going R, I like that player two also goes R because I get one instead of zero. And likewise for player two, if I were to, you know, go, go left while he was going R. So there's an agreeableness, but there's not necessarily an agreement behind this, okay? And I, I emphasize this, put it in caps because it parallels our title, convention without convening. Convening means sitting down and talking it out, coming up with a plan and agreeing to it, right? So we can have agree agreeableness without agreement and we can have convention without convening. Um, now, L Lewis next st stipulates uh, what he calls a coordination problem. He defines coordination problem it must contain at least two proper coordination equilibria. And the proper here is saying more than ties, like it's, it's, it's you know, confining away, getting away from having uh, ties in the outcome, because, you know, funny things can happen with ties, um, ties and payoff, that is. Um, and so that's just a way of bounding away from, from those problems. Um, and so in a coordination problem as just defined, there's no such thing as the only possible coordination equilibrium. He just said it has two. And again, I put this in cap because it parallels something we're going to see for coordination. An example is, is language. Uh, that's one of the most famous, you know, topics that people use the concept of coordination for. Um, in English, we say cup. In Swedish, they say cup. And so those are two different conventions among two different uh, societies or populations. Um, and I'll use this example as we go. 
Now, as he gets into, as Lewis gets into defining convention, and he works through a number of definitions before he comes to his final definition, he he makes it human. He gets beyond proper game theory. Proper game theory is really just a set of mathematical uh, terms and, and formulations. Nash is really just a set of mathematical conditions and coordination equilibrium is just a set of, of mathematical conditions. But now he's doing social science and he's actually talking about human beings and it's beyond proper game theory uh it, very much in the style of thomas schelling as in the strategy of conflict schelling was on lewis's uh dissertation committee as i understand it and he was certainly heavily influenced by schelling and um refers to schelling in the book I think his dissertation advisor, by the way, was Quine, the philosopher Quine. <clears throat> so in being more discursive, human um, about it, first of all, he uses proper to get away from the problem of ties. He also allows for odd birds, as it were, people who don't actually follow the um, convention just because he's not going to let, you know, a couple of odd birds kind of upset the idea that there's basically a convention in a population. And he speaks, this is more important, he speaks more loosely about the human experience of following a regularity of a population of people. These are people now um, experiencing a recurrent situation, a very human concept, like a situation, not a game, a formal game. So, in moving to this to convention, we actually the, the term coordination actually drops out of the definition. And that's because coordination, mutual coordination we're talking about, um, um, is too formal and rigid, as it were. But I started with coordination because it's a it's a stepping stone. It's a it's it's a way to kind of get accustomed and then see that we're moving into this more discursive philosophizing. Okay, or theorizing. Okay, <clears throat> so here's the final definition. Um, a regularity R, okay, like saying cup for one of these, okay, in, a, in the behavior of the members of a population P when they are agents in a recurring or a current situation S, like trying to communicate something about objects like this, is a convention, if and only if it is true, and it is common knowledge in P, that in almost all instances of this recurrent situation S among members of this population P, and it's got five conditions. Now, before I go to the five conditions, let me just pause a little bit more about what's been said here so far. This population P is not necessarily all the people contained in a geographic area. It could be a subgroup of that population. For example, the Hasidic Jews. Um, it could be a convention just among that subgroup, okay? And this is part of the suppleness of using this idea of convention, namely that You've got to kind of think, see and, and communicate what population you're talking about. It's not everybody in the United States. It's not everybody in Brooklyn. It's the Hasidic Jews, perhaps, as we're discussing a certain convention among the Hasidic Jews. Um, and this also means that, you know, it's common knowledge in P. So it's among them that they understand this regularity as convention. It's not necessarily the case with others, and it's not practiced necessarily with others. One thing this implies is that people in P know that their other, their, the person they're interacting with is part of P. And if they see that they're not part of P, you know, they don't have these same expectations and common knowledge, okay? So, if and only if almost everyone, 
again, in this subgroup or this population P, conforms to R, the regularity of behavior. Almost everyone expects almost everyone else to conform to R. So notice that he's got almosts in here. This is what I mean by allowing odd birds. He's not going to let a few guys who break the convention, you know, upset the notion that there is a prevalent convention, that there is a regularity that fits this definition. Almost everyone has approximately the same preferences regarding all possible combinations of actions. What he's getting at here is that <clears throat> when I'm in your situation in the interaction, because, you know, our position like if I'm at the red light and you're at the green light, you know, that's different. But when I'm when I'm in your situation, I have the same kind of preferences, you know, to, to go forward on the road at a green light uh, and things like that. Um, almost everyone prefers that anyone more conform to R on condition that almost everyone conform to R. Okay, so this is like that agreeableness condition. I like it, given that I and most of the rest of us are doing R, I like it that you do R. That's not the Nash condition, that's that second condition about I like that you do R as well. You know, if I say cup for this when we're talking English, I like it that you say cup, all right? And then here. Almost everyone would prefer that anyone more conform to some other regularity are prime on condition that almost everyone conform to R prime. See, this is key. There's got to be an R prime out there that's kind of salient and coherent. For example, R is calling this cup, but you know. We could all call this cup the way the Swedes do. And that would be our prime. And if everyone did our did that for whatever reason, then we would like people to say cup. You know, if I did, if I said cup in English, like somehow that word got put in, just like other Swedish words, you know, have gotten into this English language. Um um, then I would want to do it myself and I would want others to. So this is very key here. So conven a, a convention like R implies an R prime, and there ought to be an R prime in our thinking when we talk about a convention, like a, maybe not an explicit or specific one, but at least the idea that it wouldn't be hard to think of one or to come up with one. Um, just as in language, you know, different spellings, different words, different semantics for signifying different objects. Um, and for that matter, in language as well, different grammar. I mean, we could vary our grammar and do some other convention. You know, this is happening uh, with um, uh, pronouns, right? Where is they now sometimes singular? And are they conforming to that other convention, our prime? where they can be singular or there can be singular. So yeah, language of course is again, a very matter of convention. And so with all five of these, he's, well, he says here, where R prime is some possible regularity in the behavior of members of P such that almost no one in almost any instance of S um, that is the recurrent situation among this population could conform to both R prime and R. We can't say both cup and cup, right? Let me say that again, cup and cup, okay? They're kind of, you know, incompatible. Um, <clears throat> so here we see there's no such thing as the only possible convention. All right, because there's got to when we talk about a convention R, there's got to be a possible R prime. And this is like parallel to what I said about coordination problem. If there's a coordination equilibrium, there's got to be another coordination equilibrium. There's no such thing as the only possible coordination equilibrium in a coordination problem. So he says, and this is a direct quote, 
there's no such thing as the only possible convention. So Lewis here gives a rather beautiful definition, well developed, never challenged or you know criticized to my knowledge. And this gives the this idea of convention, Lewisian convention, if you will, after David Lewis. A quite a kind of rigor and clarity that I think a lot of the words that we use in social sciences um, often lack. For example, words like norms, customs, institutions. Th those are vaguer. It's not to say that they don't have their place. I use those words as well. But convention, you really should be thinking this. And, and you should really, if you can, see this where in your discourse, in your research, it is the thing to see, okay? In other words, if it's if what you're doing and you want to get at really is convention, Lewisian convention, <clears throat> call it that. It's better than calling it institutions or norms or something, because those are just sort of vaguer and broader, it seems to me or at least they're used as such. Um, when others speak, I, I try to be careful. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> there's no such thing as the only possible convention. Now, <clears throat> Quine wrote a foreword to Lewis's book and Quine said, when I was a child, I pictured our language as settled and passed down, that is to say sort of originating or emanating from, a board of syndics seated in grave convention along a table in the style of Rembrandt. Now he's, he's charmingly using the word convention in the original older sense here of convening, like a convention center. Okay, and that that is, you know, actual convention from convening. So he's saying, I imagine them convening and kind of settling or originating our language. The picture remained for a while undisturbed. This is when he was a child by the question of what language the syndics might have used in their deliberations. It's paradoxical to think about the origins of language because um, how do people, you know, in a convening way anyway, um, deliberate over <laughs> what language should be unless they already have language, right? Um, he says, oh, and also undisturbed by the dread of vicious regress, which is you get a regress here. I don't think it's necessarily vicious. Um, I don't think regresses, uh, you know, I think regresses are key, in fact, so they're not all vicious, they're just part of the way it is, and you got to get used to it. Um, so you see this here, him raising this whole issue about uh, the, the how, how conventions in the Lewisian sense um, evolve, right, through time. <clears throat> What you have, again, is agreeableness without agreement. And so similarly, we have convention now without convening in the Lewisian sense, okay? Like calling this cup. It's not as though, it's again, it's not, it's not as though um, there, was a, there was a convening that um, decided that we would call that kind of object a cup. Now, this really helps to understand um, this book by Hume, uh, and in, in particular, the third book of this you know, work by Hume, um, <clears throat> where he develops this new idea of convention that is the Lewisian idea. And Lewis is explicit about this. He says that he is developing his idea along the lines of Hume. He sees it as fitting Hume, and I think it fits beautifully. Um, and again, I don't think that's been never questioned or anything. And then, so Hume is doing political theory, jural theory with this new idea, and it creates a Humean 
brand, you could say, of political theory and jural theory. Not that it's all entirely new or something, but he's, I think, really making great progress. And he clearly influenced uh, people who followed him, including Adam Smith, I would say Edmund Burke, and others. Okay. Um, and, and so he says very clearly that convention is not a matter of consent always. And I, he's developing a notion of convention that does not come from convening. Um, he says this quite explicitly. He addresses the polysemy of the word convention itself, how he is basically introducing a new meaning, a second meaning that you need to understand to follow what he's saying when he talks about certain things as matters of convention. And he does this for two things in the treatise of human nature, and again, in particular, book three of it, two things in particular. And that is commutative justice, which is your duty not to mess with your neighbor's person, property, or promises due. Promises due is like contract and consent, things owed to them through um, contract and consent. Um, so all of those things um, in commutative justice, person, property, promises due, you can think of that as stuff. So it's a duty not to mess with your neighbor's stuff. Um, he, he might speak of just property as kind of like the major staple there. And in fact, your person can be thought of if you think of yourself as a soul, your soul owns your person, right? This is my hand, I being the soul and the hand being part of my person. So property is pretty extensive and then there's promises due. So the our you know, allegiance to that duty not to mess, where does that come from? And he does he says it does not come from this. This is all different words here contract, consent, compact, covenant, um, he said, or a promise of some sort, you could also put in here. Um, it does not come from that. So he's a no here. And then the other great application is political authority. Um, our allegiance, obedience to what emerges as the focal political authority. Um, <clears throat> that too, he says, does not come from contract. So he rejects social contract, all right? And and I just have these names here, but we could list others. I think I'd include Burke here. I think Hosea Tucker and others follow here. And this is different than earlier. So this relationship and evolution is quite interesting. These guys... I think it's only in passing, actually, but they say yes and yes here. And there's a number of things to say about that. One is I don't think Grotius would have frowned upon Hume here. I think he would have, like if he got to read Hume's development of Lewisian convention, he, I think Grotius would be, that's cool. I like that. And, you know, if I had thought that out and developed it, you know, I can see why you'd say that. So I don't I don't think there's like a deep, real difference in outlook between them. I think Hume and Smith both loved Grotius, um, but it just wasn't there yet, you know, so they weren't ready. You know, it takes time to develop great ideas. Um, and um, Hume advanced the ball. He just advanced the ball down the field. So that's one way to think about it. Um, I'll get to Locke in a second. Let me just say, say something here about political authority. There's two sides of, you know, the, the relationship to political authority. There's the um, allegiance, obedience, um, to political authority on the side of the governed. And then there's also the responsibilities uh, and duties of the governor, right? And so these guys were invoking contract. And these guys, I'd say, did it primarily to instill that duty to political authority. 
to kind of tamp down resistance, rebellion, rambunctiousness, kind of like, come on, folks, we want to try to get a stable, integrated polity, nation being the top polity. We want to try to get a stable, integrated nation going and try to make it functional and good. You know, these guys lived through a lot of chaos, especially Grotius uh, with, the, with the 30 years war. Um, and, um, and, and so they, they were actually emphasizing that this was this allegiance to political authority was a contract bearing on the citizens. You promised not to be, you know, so rambunctious. So put up with some stuff you don't like about the political authority. Go along, you know, don't make so much trouble. Don't try to overthrow things all the time. Don't break all the rules, um, you know, the government's rules. Um, so that's kind of their, more their concern in their political situation. Locke is interesting in, um, obviously, but um, he says no to this. Now he doesn't talk convention, but he does not make this allegiance to not messing with your neighbor's stuff, a matter of contract or consent, but he does make political authority that. And Locke now, has more of the other side of that relationship in mind, the duty of the governor. And he is concerned that the governor is not doing its duty and is, you know, not doing what's right for the polity. And he is sort of suggesting they've broken a contract and that justifies rebellion or resistance. And this, of course, was very, very popular. First of all, this was convenient for, um, you know, the Glorious Revolution in sort of dumping James II. But uh, then it, of course, became very popular as the colonies in the Americas started getting rambunctious and sassy towards their governors. They invoked consent, political consent. This was a major, you know, slogan of the revolution of Thomas Paine, and it's in the Declaration of Ind Independence, consent of the governed. Um, so that's very Lockean there. But these guys say, no, it's not consent. They reject social contract. And I, I agree with these guys, so I'm here with them in this column. Um, now, that's not to say you don't have obligations. It's just that not all obligations come from you know, the prestige of commutative justice. And in, in, and in particular, the prestige of contract. They're saying you have obligations that come from other things um, that do not go back to this or do not stem from this. Um, and Hume has here convention, all right? So it create, Hume really kind of creates, um, gives life to a Humean conventionalist theory of political authority or government. Okay. Um, now, does that mean that Hume is not for natural law since he's saying it's convention? He's saying even that commutative justice and property are convention. Does that mean he's not natural law um, or natural rights? And I wanna start getting into that and essentially argue, no, it does not mean that. This quote from Hayek was very concerned with these matters, and he said, there may, exist, there may exist just one way to satisfy certain requirements for forming an extended order, that is to say a large, prosperous, flourishing society, just as the development of wings is apparently the only way in which organi organisms can become able to fly. The wings of insects, birds, and bats have quite different genetic origins. Okay, so you so the analogy here is that different kinds of wings are like different, well, let's take the language example, different vocabularies, you know, you know different words in the dictionary of different languages. Those are different. They're also different grammars for different languages. But in terms of, you know, getting to something that we're sort of presupposing is 
desirable, worthwhile, meaningful, important to all of us. That's why we're having these conversations like human well-being, like prosperity, like human flourishing. Um, these are the basic suppositions of our whole, you know, activity. Um, some kind of wings are necessary. Some kind of system is necessary, and in that sense, natural. All right. So any particular set of wings may not be necessary, particular shape, and so on. But um, but if you want to fly, you got to have wings. Okay. And so that's very parallel here, and it creates a kind of naturalness. So Eric and I talk natural convention. So we put together nat nature and convention into natural convention, overcoming that strong um, separation that is fairly traditional in a lot of discourse between nature and convention. We're saying we're putting them together. And 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 by the way, this is a shorter piece. I'll link it, the link to it below. Um, that might be more accessible than our constitutional political economy piece. Um, we, def we say we can define natural convention as a social practice whose concrete form in time and place allows for various expressions and is therefore conventional, but whose generalized form is necessary and hence natural to social development beyond the primeval state. Okay, so I think this is a very important meaning to this beyond the primeval state, getting to something beyond the primeval state, something like where we're at, we're not in the primeval state, um, is, a, is one very important meaning of the word natural. And if something is necessary to that, that's that's natural. And these things that we're talking about that Hume is dwelling on, um, property slash commutative justice and political authority, these are necessary, okay, for the extended order, as Hayek put it. And so we have natural conventions here. This idea that Hume is part of the natural law tradition is not novel, it's proper. Um, there's a distancing sometimes of Hume from that, and he's partly to blame for that, for some lousy kind of talk that he did in the treatise. That talk falls away after the treatise. And so, and remember, he disavowed the treatise. So it's very proper to say he decided that uh, that wasn't uh, right, basically. Um, and he, even in the treatise, he, he's equivocal and ironic about it, um, and in fact explicitly allows for what we're saying here about natural convention. But the point is, is that as Buckle's great book says very clearly at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, Hume is natural law, Grotius to Hume, okay? So Hume is actually properly in the natural, understood as in the natural law tradition. And again, it's not just Buckle. I cite uh, these other people here. And Hawkinson says, in fact, Hume would be happy to be considered a natural law theorist, provided you let him define what's meant by natural law. And what Hawkinson is getting at here is when you understand convention, Lewisian convention, Sure, we have these natural obligations to whichever forms of commutative justice, whichever forms of political authority are conventional in our population, in our society. All right, so Hume is natural law. <clears throat> so let's take this example about cup versus cup. So in as you know English speakers, it, it's natural to say Jim filled his cup as opposed to Jim filled his cup. Okay. Um, that's some there's something improper about this and hence non-natural. All right. Sometimes I email with Swedes and sometimes they slip Swedish words into, 
you know, what they're writing to me in English. I don't do Swedish. Um, and, and I think they would all agree like, oh, that was a mistake. I didn't mean to put a Swedish word there. So this is the thing. While calling, you know, that kind of object a cup is for we English speakers a convention, it's a regularity R because there is a regularity R prime like cup that if we were all doing that would also be a convention. There is something deeper here, which is that we follow these sets of rules as they present themselves in our social world. And we don't arbitrarily or capriciously deviate sometimes from those, okay? And that basic orientation about sets of rules in our context, that is not a convention. That is natural. It is not a convention because there is no alternative regularity, R prime, that would allow for that capriciousness, right? We just reject that. And we would be opposed to other people doing it, even if many people were being capricious. We would stick to our guns, right? It's not about just switching, right? So there's a naturalness because, you know, being capricious about sets of rules isn't conducive to the extended order, to flourishing, to all the things we presuppose as our purposes in having these conversations. So, so you see underneath the convention of cup versus cop, there's a, a, a more basic practice and commitment, you could say, to something that is simply natural. So those particular conventions that then arise, like a, the English language, are conventions, but they're natural conventions. We're going to need something like that if we're going to get beyond the primeval state. Okay, so, so from natural convention stems both commutative justice and political authority. From, com from natural convention stems the obligation of both. Don't try to base the one on the other. In other words, don't base political authority on contract. That's the error that Hume was um, criticizing. Hume speaks of the underpinnings as the general interests or necessities of society. And there's something just overwhelmingly natural about that. <clears throat> he says, and this is from the essays, by the way, it's not from the treatise, the general interests or necessities of society are sufficient to establish both. He says explicitly that there's some deeper earth that these two things stem from, okay? Political authority is not an offshoot of commutative justice, rather both arise from common earth, okay? So he's against social contract, and this is Hume again from the essays. When we assert that all lawful government arises from the consent of the people, we certainly do them, uh, I think he means lawful governments, or the people of lawful governments, we certainly do them a great deal more honor than they deserve. He thinks there's danger and error in thinking of um, lawful government being based on political consent, on consent. And I agree with him. Um, in fact, I think history has, in a sense, um, very much borne out the kind of warning or concern that he was expressing here. And this in Hume, uh, that is to say, a, a, a kind of non-acceptance of social contract theory of government is not um, uncommon by any means among classical liberals. This is an extremely casual um, and tentative listing. There certainly are a number of classical liberals, people you might think of as classical liberals or proto-liberals, um, who are pro-social contract, like these folks are some names that I've put up here. Again, this is very tentative. Don't hold my feet to the fire on these. I haven't done my homework. 
on all these. And you can grow this list enormously in both columns. Um, but a whole lot of famous leading thinkers of classical liberalism either are silent on social contract or are explicitly anti-social contract. And I make this point because Patrick Deneen and Yoram Hazoni and others have been pinning, you know, have, have they've been critical of liberalism, I, uh, something they call liberalism. It's actually a composite, an incoherent composite that mashes together very opposite things. Um, I'm not a fan of these 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 uh, theorists, um, and they have been pinning social contract on liberalism and even classical liberalism, and um, that's just wrong. I mean, you know, sorry, but that's just not good intellectual history for starters. Well, thank you for your attention.